Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. Hello friends, welcome back to the lecture series on Introduction to Science Fiction Studies. In the previous lecture, we have looked into the history of science fiction throughout the ages or rather down the ages. Whenever we discuss science fiction, it shouldn't be in separation. It must always be inside a discourse. In this particular uh, series, you can see we are going to discuss an introduction to the big three. In the previous lecture, I have first mentioned the big three. The big three of science fiction are Robert Heinlein, Sir Arthur Charles Clarke or Arthur C. Clarke and Isaac Asimov. So these three people have contributed immensely to the domain of science fiction. Whenever we discuss science fiction, either we discuss ABC of science fiction or we discuss the big three of science fiction. The ABC previously I have also discussed that. That is one is um, Asimov, another is Bradbury and the last one is Charles. That is Arthur C. Clarke. ABC of science fiction. We have taken out Bradbury from that because Bradbury was mostly into fantastic narratives. His uh, works were not strictly speaking science oriented fantasy literature is a different genre altogether so bradbury had immense potential and he has written or has contributed to the field of science fiction but these three authors that is heinlein clark and asimov their contribution is seminal their contribution is the maximum when we discuss science fiction studies so this is the timeline of these three authors Robert Heinlein 1907 to 1988 Sir Arthur Charles Clarke 1917 to 2008 that is he passed away very recently Isaac Asimov 1920 to 1992 so these three authors that we are going to discuss we are going to discuss about their life and works we are also going to look at their major sci-fi that is science fiction uh, contributions and we will the third point that we will look into their awards they have received and recognition along with these two things we will also discuss influence influence is what takes us to the next um, paradigm of science fiction studies that after Heinlein, after Clark, after Asimov, how did the world change? How did the discourse on science fiction studies change? So influence is one of the most important things that you must try to understand while reading any author. Suppose you're reading Shakespeare, you will see the entire European civilization, even the Indian authors have never been able to come out of the influence of Shakespeare. So influence is a very uh, deciding factor when it comes to literature and especially in science fiction studies because technology is also uh, in a sort of built from inspiration. Someday uh, Leonardo da Vinci designed a flying machine that became an influence on many inventors right down until the Wright brothers invented the aeroplane or the actual flying machine. So uh, influence is a, a, is a very important aspect. Beginning with Robert Heinlein, the philosopher of science fiction. We call him the philosopher of science fiction for one reason, that most of his science fiction works, they have a lot of reflections. Now what do we understand by reflections? Whenever a person is reflecting on a particular topic, he is 
balancing pros and cons of that idea whether it is good to have this kind of system in the society whether it is bad to have this kind of system in the society whether it is spiritually ethically correct to go towards this kind of ambition everywhere whenever there is a change in technology whenever there is a change in system when the whenever there is a shift in the system we find robert heinlein thinking about it meditating on it reflecting on it ruminating on it so every time one reflects one meditates one is able to think of all the aspects surrounding it if i ruminate on my life i will think of how much time i am utilizing to make it better how much time i am utilizing to make it worse how much time i am utilizing to make other people's lives better who are attached to me who are around me how much time i am giving to the people who are causing me harm so these things uh, i will only understand once i start meditating on that topic so heinlein in his books whenever he mentions a technological development he talks about the options that it gives to the society what are the good things for example the ai question right now the artificial intelligence that we have now everybody is asking is artificial intelligence going to take over the world this is the raging question for all the people around the world right now are the robots going to rule humanity are we going to be uh, slaves to the robots so these are the things that we need to think very thoroughly should the robots be given citizenship if they have developed a sort of idea of their own life these will come only with discussion and discourse meditation and reflection so heinlein if he writes a book of 600 pages you will find 300 pages are dedicated to that rumination reflection meditation so that is why we are calling him the philosopher of science fiction moving on to the um, other details of his life he was born in july 7 1907 in butler missouri usa so he was through and through an american writer he was not an immigrant he did not come from a different place he was born and brought up in usa graduated from the united states naval academy in 1929 served in the us navy so he was not a um, commoner he was a soldier who was serving in the us navy aeronautical engineer and naval officer so he was not only in the soldier rank he was promoted to the naval officer rank and he was also an aeronautical engineer so he had multiple skills multiple talents along with that he chose to write started writing science fiction stories in the late 1930s so right after his graduation in 1929 he started writing science fiction stories first story published lifeline 1939 pioneered a new wave of science fiction known as speculative fiction we have discussed new wave of science fiction in the previous lecture so if you just want to know the features and the major works that were being written during the new wave of science fiction you just uh, go and watch lecture number 3 uh, which discusses science fiction down the ages works often explored political social and technological themes of course his works were not only meant for science fiction whenever there is a change in development whenever there is a change whenever there is a change in technological development there will be repercussions in the society the politics will change the government will change for example at one point of time we did not have upi the thing that you do with your mobile phone you scan and you pay using paytm phone pay g pay that has revolutionized the field of economy that has revolutionized how you do business with other people that was unthinkable 20 years before everything everywhere either you pay via check or via cash but nowadays you don't really see cash that much all you see is a figure in your uh, mobile phone which keeps on decreasing as you keep on transferring 
the figures uh, from that uh, account to a different account. So it is all virtual money right now. So the government, is it not getting help? Yes, it is getting help because now it is be able to track all the transactions that you are doing. Suppose you make a payment to a person uh, who is a terrorist. The government will be able to immediately track down that terrorist and what are the payments that he has received on his account and if that uh, they find out that it is I who have been paying them, they will immediately come and arrest me. So that is the government has changed its policies, the government has benefited from this UPI. So the political, social and technological themes, all of these things amalgamation, they all of these things assimilated uh, together in Robert Heinlein's uh, works. I have discussed the political. How about the social? Social is nowadays you can flaunt to other people. See, I have received 10,000 rupees. See, I can show you it in my mobile phone. I have won this lottery. The social society is changing because now you have proof uh, received in your phone that you have received 10,000 rupees by playing this game, by doing that thing, by working for this person. Everywhere you are able to give proof of uh, payment. So the society, uh, even if somebody comes and says, let me see how much money you have, you have to pay for the restaurant. Suppose you are with friends and friends have gone to the restaurant. Everybody is asking uh, that um, you pay for the um, evening meal, but you show your bank account. See, it is, it says 92 paise. I don't have any money. So you have to pay for your own food. So that is also a kind of relationship that you are making with the society where you can immediately show your bank balance. See the entire uh, idea of technology and economy and society has changed th through and through after the coming of the UPI system. Emphasized individualism, self-reliance and libertarian ideas. Whenever Heinlein wrote a book, he had a very robust concept of individualism. The characters of Heinlein always mentioned were always uh, given um, a kind of individualism which was never seen before. They have very clear-cut knowledge of what is going around. They were very sure of themselves. They were sure that they can rely on themselves. See, self-reliance, that is what it is written. Libertarian ideals, everybody has uh, equal rights and privileges. So the novels that he is writing, they boosted this kind of ideals in the society. Envision space exploration, colonization and future societies. So Heinlein not only talked about space exploration, which was one of the most interesting or one of the most talked about genre during the 19th century that is the golden period of utopias we have we will be discussing that in the uh, uh, lect in lecture number eight you will see that there is a golden period of utopia there you will see that this future societies have been dealt with in multiple ways by multiple authors and space exploration is one of the first and foremost fields which have been taken up by all the big three they share this common interest of talking about space, space travel, spacemen, aliens, uh, alien interaction, alien invasion and anti number of other things related to space. Colonization, not only alien interaction and invasion, the person from earth will go to a different planet and will colonize that planet. Colonize means go over there, sit with the people and uh, start living with the people ultimately finally going and occupying a land and then growing something in that land actually the definition of colonization is that when the soldiers of one country or people from one country go to another country and there they grow something uh, grow let's say uh, crops or uh, cash crops food crops whatever it is if they grow any kind of crops in a a different country uh, land then that land is officially declared as being colonized right so the major works of robert heinlein stranger in a strange land 1961 a novel story of a human raised by martians here 
the societies the cultures have a you know conflict who returns to earth as a messianic figure with psychic abilities the martians those who uh, the, the aliens that live on mars the population of mars they raise a, a human kid they the kind of uh, culture that the martian has they in um, they impose rather they inculcate all those cultures into the upbringing of that human child so the human child when the when it grows up it has different kind of abilities uh, that normal human beings so when he returns to earth he is like a messianic figure that is like a prophet like a messiah like a savior he has psychic capabilities that is he can read minds he can do uh, mind healing and healing through faith and all of these things so psychics are those who have a very powerful mind and who can predict the future contemplate the past and read people's minds so stranger in a strange land again in this novel also you will find that there is a lot of meditation on um spiritual values so a lot of meditation that is why you know it's a philosophy that is within inside uh, within the novel starship troopers it has nothing to um nothing related to the earlier theme that we have discussed yet a military science fiction novel explores the themes of duty citizenship and the role of the military in society this has a different kind of reflection in the earlier novel stranger in a strange land we had discussed the uh, that heinlein was ruminating heinlein was discussing the spiritual values now in this one heinlein is actually talking about duty citizenship and the role of military in society what is the function of so, uh, military power in a society what are they supposed to do how are we supposed to integrate the society uh, integrate the military force into the society set in a future where soldiers fight against an alien race known as the bugs very basic story that the bugs have invaded earth and earth is now um, suffering under the peril uh, uh, under the threat of extinction and the soldiers have gathered together and they are fighting off the bugs however during all of this story there is a background of constant duty devotion to the country the military experience how the military is a part of the society all of these things are there the moon is a harsh mistress the moon is a harsh mistress published in 1966 a novel set on the moon a lunar colony struggle for independence from earth's rule it is known for its portrayal of a self aware computer named mike you will be very pleased to know that this idea of a self aware computer has been used in multiple movies and magazines and novels hereafter you will find there is uh, a computer named hal we will talk about that uh, when we come to it uh, when arthur c clark uh, is writing you will and asimov is writing they have characters like that where there is a self aware computer which knows that the human beings can shut it down sh uh, switch it on whenever they want so the here uh, the computer is mike so a lunar colony struggle for independence lunar means a colony which is living on moon they are fighting to gain independence from the uh, rulers of the earth the earth has the ultimate power because it is a bigger planet and it is a central uh, planet around which the moon is the satellite so moon is somehow dominated by the colonies living in earth but the colonies living in the moon they revolt around the colonies living on the earth that please you live in a different planet you don't rule us this is a kind of Uh, exercise a uh, literary exercise that is like the colonization of africa if we consider this as a metaphor for the colonization of many countries by the um, british empire we will find that it suits all the uh, themes very accurately it fits the context 
that you live in a different land we live in a different land there is no connection but still you have to come here and rule over us why so that is exactly what happened in india that is exactly what happened in africa and in the us every colony at one point of time was so fed up with the british empire the british imperialism that they started revolting that is what happens here also time enough for love the book is part of Heinlein's future history series. So these people have written a lot of series, not a lot of series. Uh, some of them uh, have uh, written series which has a number of books in their um, compendium. Features Lazarus Long, a character who has lived for thousands of years due to rejuvenation treatments. It's a complex tale exploring themes of immortality and love. So like the true philosopher who cannot stay away from the domain of love Heinlein also comes down and talks about love in one of his novels time enough for love the puppet masters published in 1951 this novel involves the invasion of earth by parasitic parasitic aliens that is they are, are sorts of parasites they sustain on the blood and um, they are bloodthirsty aliens that attach themselves to humans and control their actions. You will find one of these kind of concepts in a very famous movie, Men in Black. If you have not seen that, you can go and watch it. It's a very interesting movie and you will find this kind of concepts. It's a gripping tale of resistance and intrigue. So these aliens, they come to this uh, planet Earth. They sort of attach themselves to human beings and start controlling the actions of the human beings. Double Star, 1956. The story revolves around Lawrence Smith, a down and out actor who is hired to impersonate a prominent politician. The novel won the Hugo Award for Best Novel in 1956. So Double Star is again, it's not outright a science fiction story, but it is one of the best stories of Robert Heinlein. It is about a, an actor who has been hired to impersonate a politician. Job, A Comedy of Justice, 1984. This novel follows the adventures of a man named Alexander Hargen Shamer, who finds himself in parallel universe. See, again, the parallel timeline comes along with alternate versions of his life. So one person of uh, uh, Alexander Hargenschheimer is uh, a teacher, the other person is a thief, the other person is a decoy, the other person is a shopkeeper, the other person in a parallel universe is a uh, street vendor. All of these persons are the same, but their realities, their life, their personalities are different. It's a mix of science fiction and theological themes. Theological means related to God and religion. The Door into Summer, 1957. In this time travel tale. So here, for the first time, we are discussing time travel because before that we were discussing space, we were discussing alien invasion. Now we are discussing time travel. See, these are uh, the three most frequently used uh, ideas in science fiction stories. An engineer named Dan Davies goes into suspended animation to leap forward in time and seek revenge on his former business partner. So this person is very much angry with his business partner. So he goes into a time machine, goes to the future and takes revenge on his business partner. Here is a small list. Let me mention it over here. Small list of uh, awards and recognitions received by Robert Heinlein. If you just go to the Wikipedia, you will find the list is quite long. I have just given you a gross idea of what it is, how Robert Heinlein has been awarded or recognized by people uh, of our world and what are the influences that he has left behind. Recipients of several prestigious awards including Hugo, Nebula, Bram Stoker Awards. We will be discussing awards in a separate section altogether because these awards signify different aspects of science fiction and different people who have come up with these awards. So there is a separate lecture, you needn't worry. In 1974, 
named the first science fiction writer's grand master. See, he was the first to be named as grand master by the science fiction and fantasy writers of America. This is an association. They named him the grand master. Controversy due to their exploration of sensitive topics. So, he was always in a kind of controversy. Everybody was discussing that why is he discussing religion? Why is he discussing politics? Why is he discussing colonization? Why can't he write a simple uh, tale of science fiction? But after all, science fiction is somewhere at a certain level a metaphor for the human condition. This is something Kazuo Ishiguro has said. He says that the story of science fiction is always a metaphor for human condition. The human exists in that and the science fiction elements are just to estrange human. Estrangement. Estrangement, this means to make something unfamiliar. to make something unfamiliar that is you become estranged if i say that i am estranged from my family that is i am not in talking terms with my family i don't know what is happening to my family i am not in talking terms to my mother my father my brother my sister so i am estranged from all of them in science fiction suppose i'm talking about aliens will i be able to identify myself with a parasitic alien of course not I will not look in the mirror and see, oh, I am a parasitic animal. No, I will not feel like that. But some of the novels which are not science fiction, you go and say, yes, the life of this character is exactly like the life I have. So I identify with that character, but I can never identify with a robot. I can never identify with an alien. I can never identify with a Martian. Martian means uh, the people living in Mars, people or uh, whatever alien life form there is. I can never identify with them. So I will have a very objective uh, point of view. Whatever they are doing, I will not judge them. If I am identifying with uh, the characters, I will immediately start judging them, isn't it? So this estrangement is uh, due to whatever uh, uh, science fiction has imaginary elements imaginary elements so these imaginary elements again uh, are uh, related or discussed in some uh, very sensitive topics by robert heinlein so he is he was always in the midst of controversies criticism and debate surrounding themes of militarism sexuality and gender roles in the novels so these sensitive topics like religion then sexuality is itself a sensitive topic then gender roles are also sensitive so all of these have been discussed and uh, contradicted contrasted balanced and uh, compared everything has been done by robert heinlein that's why we call him a philosopher inducted into science fiction hall of fame in 1998 so after all these things, he is still considered one of the most genius of the science fiction authors and he was inducted to the Hall of Fame of Science Fiction in 1998. Now we are moving on to studying another very, very gifted person uh, called Arthur C. Clarke. He is the hard science fiction author. If you want to know what is hard science fiction, you can just refer back to lecture number two. We have discussed science fiction as a subgenre of subgenre of speculative fiction. There, I have discussed what is hard science fiction and what is softer science fiction. So, Arthur C. Clarke, born on December 16, 1997, in Minehead, Somerset, England. So, he is not an American, he is an English author. Enthusiasm for science and astronomy developed at a young age joined the Royal Air Force during World War II. So he was also a part of the military force. 
like Heinlein. Heinlein was uh, in the Navy. He was in the Air Force, involved in the development of advanced radar technology. One we call as radar these days or radar. They have different um, kind of pronunciation. So radar is most uh, common. We'll go ahead with radar. Involved in the development of advanced radar technology. Published his first science fiction story, Rescue Party, in 1946. So he started a little bit late. Collaborated with fellow author and friend Isaac Asimov. Asimov we will be reading right after this. 2001 A Space Odyssey co-wrote the screenplay with Stanley Kubrick released as a film and novel in 1968. We will discuss this particular um, story later on. The actual or original story was The Sentinel. Stanley Kubrick is a very famous film director. He read the story The Sentinel and was very much influenced by it. He immediately wanted to make a movie. 2001 Space Odyssey, he offered the script to um, Arthur C. Clarke that please, uh, can you please turn this into a movie? I want to adapt this short story into a movie. So together, Arthur C. Clarke and Stanley Kubrick, they sat and discussed the entire movie line. So the movie was released and the novel was also released. Conceptualize the idea of geostationary satellites in 1945 paper because he was a um, hard science uh, author and also he wrote papers, uh, research papers, often referred to as Clark orbit or Clark belt. So the geostationary orbits are often referred to as Clark orbit because he was the one to first conceptualize the idea of the geostationary orbit. So let us have a, ma a look at the major works of Arthur C. Clarke. 2001 A Space Odyssey, it was written in 1968, co-writing the screenplay and novel based on this film directed by Stanley Kubrick, the discovery of a mysterious monolith on the moon and the subsequent mission to Jupiter to uncover its secrets. So the monolith that we are talking about here, it is a kind of a, um, a stone structure which is waiting there, watching everything year after year for millions of years. It is recording the entire history of the human race in its mind, if it has a mind. It is able to travel through time and space and it is also able to change the time and space of the person who is coming in touch with it. So either the person who touches it grows very old when it touches it next time, it becomes a fetus. So these things are very fascinating when you go through a space odyssey. Odyssey means journey, by the way. Childhood's End, 1953. A novel, the arrival of benevolent extraterrestrial overlords who guide humanity towards a utopian future, but not without profound and unexpected consequences. So alien being... An enemy has always been around us, but alien being good people guiding us towards uh, technological advancement, that is something very new. If you remember the movies of, let's say, Indiana Jones, you will find something very akin to that. Indiana Jones and the uh, Island of the Lost Skull or something like that, you will find it's a very interesting movie where the aliens, they come from afar, they settle on earth and they guide the civilization uh, of earth towards a very improved technological era. But sadly, everything gets lost and the civilization is buried in sand. So childhood's end is also something like that. Rendezvous with Rama, 1972. Now, Rama is um, not what we as Indian authors would understand Rama as. It is actually a spacecraft full of aliens. A novel, a massive alien spacecraft named Rama enters their solar system and a team of astronauts is sent to explore its interior. It won the Hugo and Nebula Awards for Best Novel. So, uh, a massive alien spacecraft named Rama. It is actually, there is a fight between the uh, human race and the uh, spacecraft named Rama. So please do not confuse the name 
of this with the Indian mythological figure of Rama. Okay, they too are completely different things. This is a arbitrary name given by Arthur C. Clarke. The Fountains of Paradise, 1979, a novel combines space exploration and engineering, building a space elevator from Earth's surface to geostationary orbit. So it is the longest elevator that one can imagine. Elevator means lift. You have uh, nowadays lift is a very common phenomena. Every building that has more than three, four stories is having a lift right now. So you enter the compartment, you press a button, you go to the top floor. In this case, you have uh, the opportunity to go to the space orbit, geostationary orbit. The lift will carry you to that um, instant. The City and the Stars, published in 1956, a novel set in the distant future in the last inhabited city on Earth. Journey of Alvin, a unique individual seeking answers about the city's mysterious past. So this novel is again set in a very distant future, not a very near future. And this is the last inhabited city on Earth because everything else has been destroyed. So it is in the post apocalyptic phase what is apocalypse apocalypse is when everything in the earth is destroyed especially the human race when uh, suppose a meteor strikes the earth or there is a very harsh weather conditions suppose the temperature suddenly falls there is volcanic eruptions there is earthquakes and entire cities are just sunk into the bottom, into the magma pits, thereby everything is destroyed. So that is apocalypse. There was one such rumor that in 2012 the earth will be destroyed and everybody was um, very much shocked. We went through 2012 with uh, anxiety. There is also a movie that released after that named 2012. Last inhabited city on earth, journey of Alvin, the name of the character is Alvin, a unique individual seeking answers about the city's mysterious past that what happened? What is that apocalyptic event that made this city destroyed, uh, that made the world destroy itself and this city also could have been destroyed but wasn't? A Fall of Moon Dust, published in 1961, a novel set on the moon and revolves around a harrowing incident where a tourist vehicle gets trapped in a deep layer of moon dust. So this is also uh, a kind of science fiction where there is the partners uh, in that um, vehicle, the, the tourists, they travel through space, land on moon and get gets trapped in a deep layer of moon dust. What happens after that? So that is the entire novel about. We discussed the story before 1951. It is a short story, The Sentinel. The seed idea for 2001. Seed idea means because this idea is what made Stanley Kubrick, the famous director, start thinking, how about I turn this short story into a movie? So he immediately calls Arthur C. Clarke, right? And they two together sit down and write down this screenplay. An alien artifact on the moon that has been watching and waiting for a signal to be sent. So this is the artifact that we are discussing. The Nine Billion Names of God, which was published in 1953. A short story collection, a Tibetan, actually it has many short stories. The short story with this name, a uh, short story is like this, a Tibetan monastery where monks seek to compile all the possible names of God, total of, they have this idea that let us compile all the possible names of God and then we will be able to have an idea what God is like. So total, they have 26 stories in that collection and Sentinel, the Sentinel we are talking about here is published in this collection. This is a list of awards and influences of Arthur C. Clarke. You cannot, again, limit the awards and influence of Arthur C. Clarke. Once you open the page of Wikipedia, it is again a very long list. This is only uh, to give you an idea what it is like. 
recipient of Hugo Nebula and Bram Stoker Awards just like Robert Heinlein, inducted into Science Fiction Hall of Fame in 2000. Just like Robert Heinlein, the Arthur C. Clarke Award, an annual British Science Fiction Literary Prize, was established in his honor. So something which he did was um, he wrote so much of hard science fiction. He talked about science fiction. He tried to spread the word of science fiction that he was um, uh, actually an award was named after him, that Arthur C. Clarke Award. Clarke's imaginative description of futuristic technologies and extraterrestrial worlds have inspired numerous concept artists and illustrators. He gave so much details. He described the situations so well that the visuals that he created in the minds of his readers actually uh, inspired the computer generated imagery that is CGI techniques of this modern world. The way he described an event exactly is uh, how the, the artistic environment that film directors are creating right now. Much of it goes to much of the work of visualizing it in the first place goes to Arthur C. Clarke. Depictions of spaceships, space stations and alien landscapes have influenced the visual aesthetics of science fiction art, CGI generated imagery. Now we move on to the third author of the big three that is Isaac Asimov. Not third author in the list of the merit but third author in chronology. So first was Robert Heinlein, he is the oldest of the three. The second one in the middle is Arthur C. Clarke and the third one is Isaac Asimov. He was a professor of biochemistry. So he also practiced hard science fiction but his had lots of imagination, lots of creativity and he continued the story, most of his stories he continued in a series. We will get to know that also in some time. Unlike the previous two writers, one was from America, one was from England, Asimov was born in Russia. He was not in and out an American. Then his family moved to America when he was a three-year-old kid. Early interest in reading and writing, earned a PhD in biochemistry from Columbia University, worked as a professor, researcher and writer, started writing science fiction stories in 1930s. First published story, Marooned of Vesta, wrote over 500 books. Remember, he is one of the most avid writers and readers, of course. He read a lot of books and he wrote a lot of books. He wrote over 500 books and numerous short stories during his career. Known for his ability to explain complex scientific concepts in a clear and accessible manner. So, whenever anybody asked him to explain whatever is happening in the books, he actually gave a very detailed description. He explained the events of his book and he started incorporating those explanations among the story um, points. Whenever he is explaining a scientific event that is taking place in his novel, he is giving the exact scientific description how that can happen. It is very fascinating. These are the major works of Isaac Asimov. Foundation 1951. A novel, remember Foundation is an entire series. A novel, first book in the Foundation series. Mathematician Harry Seldon who predicts the fall of the galactic empire and establishes a plan to shorten the ensuing dark age. So Harry Seldon is a mathematician and through his mathematics, he is able to predict that the galactic empire, galactic the word comes from galaxy, that the empire which existed throughout the galaxy, again Asimov has built an entire galaxy full of um, alien life. So the empire is going to fall and how it is going to fall and what will be the consequences. So this particular person, Harry Seldon, knows it all. I, Robot, 1950. 
this is again let me tell you this is not in chronological order that i have uh, mentioned the works these are mentioned mostly according to the popularity of these books like foundation is the most popular series of isaac asimov a collection of short stories i robot set in a future where robots have become an integral part of society introduces the three laws of robotics the interactions between humans and robots i robot is a short story again let me tell you like arthur c clarke wrote the sentinel and everybody was uh, very much in awe and it went on to become a very big success i robot also originated as a short story it gave the three laws of robotics which the entire domain of science and technology still follows to this day we will discuss the three laws of robotics in some time robot series various books from the 1950s to 1980s expands on the themes introduced in i robot and includes novels like the caves of steel the caves of steel the naked sun and robots of dawn featuring the detective eliza bailey and his robot partner r daniel oliver before this we discussed self aware computer one was named as mike one was named as hal now here we have another robot but this time it is not a computer anymore this time it's it is a computer that can walk around and move their hands and look like human structure right so its name is robot daniel oliver the gods themselves 1972 a novel a parallel universe where the laws of physics are different and an energy exchange threatens the ex existence of both universes it won the hugo nebula and john w campbell memorial awards so the gods themselves it is again a novel where parallel universes are there and laws of physics are different in both the parallel universe where one gravity is there another i am giving an example one has gravity another does not has gravity one has time another's time flows backwards so the laws are different in both the universe and an energy exchange when these two universes parallel universes come very close to each other there is an energy exchange and that is going to threaten the existence of both the worlds like one is positive another is negative in 1941 He wrote a novel called Nightfall. He wrote a short story called Nightfall, a planet with multiple suns. So this is very interesting. We have a sun with multiple planets, but what if one planet has multiple suns, where night comes only once every two thousand years? So in this planet, every time the planet is getting light, so only once in two thousand years night falls. leading to catastrophic consequences for the inhabitants the inhabitants of that planet they experience day all the time suddenly with night falls everybody is shocked and uh, there are multiple consequences to that society and there are multiple catastrophic consequences to the people living in them prelude to foundation 1988 a novel first book in the second foundation trilogy and serves as a prequel to the original foundation series so the foundation series which was written in the first what happened before the foundation is written after that it's very interesting i'll give you the whole list the early life of harry selden second foundation 1953 this is the third book in the foundation series where the protagonist must find the elusive second foundation to protect the plan against threats so again there is a threat to the galactic empire and the protagonist must find the second foundation the end of eternity in this novel a secret organization known as eternity manipulates time to improve the course of human history it raises questions about the cost of tampering with timeline Uh, before this we were discussing parallel histories before this we were discussing parallel timelines but this time we are discussing what are the pros and cons mostly the cons that a person can face if that person wants to play with time 
So time, if you change one aspect, the entire result will be completely different. So the end of eternity. This is what the foundation series looks like. Looks like means what are the books that are there. So this is the original foundation trilogy. This is the thing that was published in the beginning. See 1951, 52 and 53. These are the three novels in that series. Then we have extended foundation series. This is again was published after the original trilogy. But the story that is before the foundation trilogy is the third to be published. This is three. This is one. First published, second published. And this is the third one to get published. Prelude to foundation 1988. Forward the foundation 1993. So what is this foundation series? Let me tell you a little bit about Harry Seldon. Harry Seldon is a person who applies psychohistory. This is a term that Asimov has himself coined and he is um, credited as the originator of psychohistory. He is credited as the originator of psychohistory, combines history, sociology and mathematical statistics to make general predictions about the future behavior of very large groups of people. Now here I will make you understand this concept even more clearly by referring to a very popular web series Westworld. It is I think available in Disney, Watchstar or um, maybe some related platforms. Westworld, uh, the story is written by Jonathan Nolan. Jonathan Nolan is the brother of Christopher Nolan. Jonathan Nolan and Lisa Joy. These two people have written the story of the Westworld. The Westworld is a kind of place which gathers information of the client's behavior. It is an entertainment park. Everybody goes there and they get entertained by the possibilities of the land because there are multiple robots who are playing a story. The robots somewhere uh, are uh, uh, trying to um, sabotage uh, an ongoing, um, let's say, procession. Somewhere the robots are fighting amongst themselves. These are all storylines happening inside that entertainment park. And you can go there and you can kill anybody, you can destroy anybody, you can flirt with anybody. So all the robots are in a storyline. You can go and enter any storyline anytime. That kind of amusement park. So every time you are entering a storyline, the robots are continuously analyzing what is your behavior. So based on your behavior, your profile is being created and it is being uploaded. So from there, there is a huge database of these profiles. Once your behavior is understood, then people uh, who have that kind of machines, they can analyze your behavior and thereby predict what you are going to do in future. So this is exactly what psychohistory is all about. Um, Westworld is only an extended idea of the series. You can uh, go and have a look at it again. This is Asimov's Three Laws of Robotics. This is Asimov's Three Laws of Robotics. It is famous throughout international waters. Waters, I mean international territories. Everywhere, uh, every time robotics is discussed, Asimov's Three Laws of Robotics is also mentioned. Number one, a robot may not injure a human being or through inaction allow a human being to come to harm. This is rule number one, law number one. A robot must obey orders given to it by human beings except where such orders would conflict with the first law. So first law is robot may not injure a human being. If a human being wants the robot, wants this particular robot to harm another human being, then this robot will not do that. A robot must protect its own existence as long as such protection does not conflict with the first or second law. So a robot must try to protect itself. But if it comes in 
contradiction with the first law that a robot may not injure a human being a robot must not obey orders given to it by human beings so if the human being asks the robot to destroy itself the robot may not do that the robot may not also uh, in the process of destroying itself harm any other human beings so these are very uh, ethically morally sound issues that has been uh, established by uh, isaac asimov in his uh, short story and it is followed throughout uh, the entire um, human technological civilization that we have if you also have uh, if you want to have more idea about this there is exactly a movie named i robot starring will smith you can go and watch the movie and you will understand more about the three laws of robotics these are the list of awards and influences that isaac asimov had let me read it out to you one of them will be very fascinating i can promise recipient of multiple hugo retro hugo retro hugo means the hugo awards were being given and let's say in 1990s uh, asimov has won a hugo award for a book that he has written in 1940s so that is called retro hugo nebula locus and bram stoker awards he was also named a grand master by the science fiction and fantasy writers of america this association also named isaac asimov as a grand master of science fiction writing in 2009 a crater on the planet mars asimov was named in his honor so the mars in mars there was is a crater and it still is crater means a, a very big kind of um, depression in the soil or in the topography of the landscape the lines that you see in a telescope in a different uh, planet through the telescope on the surface of different planets they are actually craters craters and one of the craters is named as asimov foundation for space opera space opera we have already discussed this before but here you will find it more a more enhanced definition of space opera a sub genre of science fiction grand scale galactic empires and political intrigue rise and fall of civilizations so civilizations across the universe civilizations across the galaxy this is that is the um, that is the range of the story of a space opera asimov's three laws of robotics fundamental concepts in robot fiction and discussion on artificial intelligence ethics so whenever there is a discussion on the ethics of artificial intelligence don't worry in our advanced science fiction studies course we will identify all of these major points and discuss it separately so after you finish this course you can go for the advanced studies in science fiction so there you will find a detailed description of intelligence uh, artificial intelligence and ethics so you can have a look at that now we have a list of questions for us here today if we are able to answer these questions effectively and um, in a proper way then we will know that this course has uh, contributed to our better understanding of science fiction let us have a look at the questions mention three major works of robert heinlein can we discuss heinlein as a philosopher if yes then why what is the most important feature in the science fiction works of arthur c clarke discuss asimov's contribution to science fiction what are the three laws of robotics who established them which work of arthur c clarke can be considered as an inspiration for stanley kubrick's movie 2001 a space odyssey who has a crater in mars named after him how many short stories were individually written by isaac asimov arthur c clarke and robert heinlein this is for gk and when you answer this question uh, you will have a better understanding of the literary output while you research for this question what according to you is the role of the big 3 in advancement of the field of science fiction so i hope you will uh, go through these uh, questions and try to answer them and while answering them if you need any reference materials 
here is a list of books which are going to help you. The first three are dedicated to Heinlein. These are critical books on Heinlein. Then we have books on um, uh, Clark. So these are the books where uh, you will find details about Arthur C. Clark. Arthur C. Clark, um, especially Cadden Mike, uh, this uh, article is very good and uh, Stephenson, Gregory Stephenson is very good. Then the last three is about Isaac Asimov. Uh, Asimov has a huge fan base and a lot of work has been written, but I have given you only three um, reference materials. But I will always ask you to go through this book, David Seed. I have mentioned it multiple times. I have also mentioned it in the first lecture, that is um, uh, in the reference part of the first lecture, David Seed, very short introduction to science fiction, this book. And I use multiple quotations from this book. If you are a beginner trying to understand science fiction, this can be a very good starting point. Thank you very much. And uh, I hope this uh, lecture has been very fruitful to you. See you in the next one.